Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Door to Door. I'm Virginia Stanley of the Library Marketing Department, along with Chris Connolly and Lainey Mays. And we have a really interesting and fun episode for you today. We have two, as we said in our copy, two brilliant editors talking to two brilliant authors about their brilliant books. Mm -hmm. uh, these are uh, two debuts, both on sale today, two very different books and two really wonderful so we have, um, we have David Pomerico, who is uh, editorial director at Harper Voyager. Hi, David. Hello. And David is the editor of Hench, which is written by Natalie Zena Walshot. Hello, Natalie. Hello. And we have Lucia Macro, executive editor at William Morrow. Hello. Hello. How are Hello. you? I'm good. And uh, Lucia will be speaking with her author, Claire McHugh, author of A Most English Princess. So uh, both of these books have received wonderful reviews. Uh, if you go to hc.com, you can read all about them. Um, they're, they're, um, they, they're turning heads and they're, and they're making tongues wag. So um, I am going to stop wagging my tongue and I'm gonna turn it over to um, both of you. But first we wanna raise a virtual glass to happy birthday. Happy book birthday. That's... Congratulations for one book birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're really happy to have you. Now you all met um, virtually the other day when we when uh, we did the run through. So this is your second your second meeting. But um, anything you all want to say before we put uh, David and Natalie in the uh, in the virtual green room, which basically means you sit there until we turn your camera back on. <laughs> <laughs> just congratulations to nina and claire this is a uh, natalie and, and claire uh these books are amazing and i hope uh everybody has a chance to read them and love them so thank you so much I, did I, I have i have nothing i have nothing to add to that that's that's brilliant <laughs> so. all right now, so we, well, we get like banished to a virtual prison yeah <laughs> yes where you can enjoy virtual uh m m's <laughs> a virtual room with all of the candy. Like a virtual yeah. for you. You're on your, your virtual rider. Your, contractual rider. <laughs> your vanilla cake. Your vanilla cake. Yes. Like you yeah. Take over champagne any day. All you right. Get to come back with good behavior. So we'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah. There's well, goodbye forever. <laughs> We're watching you. You just know the camera is. Um, all right. So we're going to start with Claire and Lucia mm -hmm. to talk about Most English Princess. And we're going to say goodbye temporarily to David and Natalie. But uh, again, congratulations to both of you. Two debuts on sale today, available here to talk to librarians, to talk to their editors, to talk to us. And we're really excited to have you. So thank you both so much for writing these, these great books. And uh, now we're going to hear more about them. So Natalie and David, we'll see you in a bit. Bye. 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 It's like magic. Look at that. David's still here. All right, he's gone. Oh, now he's gone. So him. now we can talk about him. Yeah. Uh, God. We talk about him behind his back. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I'm so I'm gonna jump in. Yep. Jump in. Okay. Jump. I'm jumping in because I'm. I'm so excited to be here with Claire to talk about um, Most English Princess, which is such a phenomenal book and so excited to speak to the librarians because I am a huge, huge supporter of the libraries. And the good news, totally as an aside, is our local library here where I live just op reopened yesterday. So I'm um, very excited about that. Excellent. Yes, it was very good news because they've been closed for a while and now they're back open. Um, but I will jump in now to talk about Most English Princess. So Claire, um, I just thought to start with a pretty basic question for people who maybe are not as plugged into the whole like royal universe as you and I clearly are. So just tell us who is, you know, who is Princess Vicky and like, where does she fit in this grand, you know, scheme of, you know, our favorite dysfunctional family, which are the royal, <laughs> the royal family of England. <laughs> um, Vicky was actually a key member of the family, but several, oh, well, more than a century ago. 
but at, at her time, she was really important and she actually played a huge role in world history. But let me start with her birth. Um, when Queen Victoria proposed marriage to her first cousin, Prince Albert, they expected to enjoy some months of wedded bliss before perhaps <laughs> Queen would be pregnant. She was pregnant immediately. She got married <laughs> in February and, and she was pregnant um, uh, in November. She gave birth in November. And when uh, she was having her baby, at the middle of delivery, the doctor shouted, oh my goodness, it's a princess. Mm. And uh, every, and but thankfully the queen replied immediately, not to worry, the next will be a prince. <laughs> and so the baby that was born with that sort of slight cloud of disappointment was a beautiful and very bright little girl called Victoria after her mother, known from the beginning in the family as Vicky. Mm -hmm. And her, and just as the queen had predicted, uh, only a year later, she bore a prince, Vicky's little brother, Bertie, um, later King Edward VII. Because of course, Bertie, although born second, was immediately the heir. Because as we know, men got to be, uh, male uh, children were immediately jumped over uh, uh, their older sisters. Um, I was interested in Vicky because she was the shining star of that family of nine. Prince Albert and Queen Victoria, they had nine children and Vicky was considered the brightest, the most capable um, in all ways. She was athletic, she was a great linguist, she was a very good scholar. And um, I was interested in her in her predicament that she couldn't, she was born in this important family, but she couldn't inherit. So what was gonna happen to her? And the more I read her story, the more I couldn't believe how much happened to her. <laughs> A lot happened to her, but her primary, like her prime directive, I I felt was really to get married and to marry well. And her father, Prince Albert, um, had definitely had thoughts about um, who she should marry and you know what her role was in marriage in the in you know without getting too political, but within the whole like Europe European construct of the time um so yes you're totally right Lucia. yeah and the thing about prince albert was he was very proud of his daughter and he wanted but he also wanted to make use of her and he saw her in that rat light he wouldn't let her marry some english nobleman and stay at home with 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 her parents that that didn't suit his um his, his, his <laughs> for her at all yeah. um and she did, he did mildly want her to love the husband that she married however she, most of all she wanted him to help him she wanted his her, her help in a huge project of prince albert's he was one of life's great meddlers one of his projects was unify germany <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> he was living in london did not discourage him and he thought i'll marry vicky off into the prussian royal family prussians are the most powerful germans Vicky will be a handmaiden to the birth of a new nation led by the Prussians. And instead of being a militaristic Prussian like nation, it'll be dem democratic like England because Vicky will be there. It was a, it was a large ambition. And it didn't all come true. I was just going to say, and it was not, well, part of it came true, but, but the large parts of it did not come true. Yes. Now, and Vicky, so Vicky marries into the Prussian royal family and she does fall in love with this, with, you know the crown i don't know what he was at the time he was, at the time that they met he was a mere time. prince just prince but he was the heir to the throne he was, the heir he was called the friedrich but everybody in the family called him fritz they met first when she was 10 10 and was 10 and but thank god they did not impose at that time any romantic expectations she was a very precocious 10 year old mm -hmm. that gave him a tour around the london exhibition in and he was a night very shy very gawky very out of place 19 year old man they met though five years later when she was nearly 15 still quite young yeah and it was at that time it was framed as well maybe you would like this guy and <laughs> <laughs> and in fact vicky's heart went out to fritz he was the child of a broken home he needed her in in some ways more than she needed him yeah. And they did fall in love and he wanted to get married right away. And thank God, Victoria and Albert said, no, 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 no. You have to be 17 before you can be married. I know. So at the whopping age of 17, this very, this very precocious young woman who I always thought her, she was, a, she was a wonderful person in so many ways, but to me, her fatal flaw, and you might disagree, was that 
she had this inclination to always want to be the smartest person in the room and sometimes she yeah. was, but well, she liked to tell everyone she was the smartest we've person. Had a, we've had such a great partnership on this, this Lucia, because your royal history is so good, and we can debate <laughs> it all the time. I do think that she had the fault of uh, of uh, thinking that she was the smartest person in the room. She also had a terrible tendency to want to improve things all the time, improve oh. things along her own in her own vision. So her children had to be improved, and Prussia had to be improved, and. Then she ran up against Otto von Bismarck and he wasn't going to have any improvement. From her. He wasn't going to improve. But we do have a wonderful, we have some wonderful photos of yeah. um, the young Vicky that we can, we can show, I think. Um, one is, there she is. I don't know how old she is. She there, is, but... a, she is a 21 in that picture. Okay. Um, it's just about the time that Fritz's grandfather, uh, great uncle, uh, grand uncle died and he became the crown prince. This is mm -hmm. her as the crown princess of Prussia. Mm -hmm. uh, roughly um, uh, uh, 1862. Right. And so she had already been married about four years at that point. Yeah. yeah. And had three children. Oh my gosh. And then we have a picture of her on her wedding day, I believe. Yeah. That we can show everybody, which is, it's kind of amazing. I feel like this might have been, I don't know if it was, but I feel like it might have been one of the first kind of British royal weddings that had. Um, they didn't have TV, but had like media coverage. Right. It was very, very well covered. Um, yes. You know, they, um, Albert and Vicky had a very strong, uh, Albert and Victoria ha knew that they would wanted to promote the royal family as not disreputable, like mm -hmm. Victoria's uncles had been, but a real family uh, and, and following domestic virtues. And so they allowed um, early coverage of the family. And then this is the way, uh, uh, Prince Albert loved photography. This is the first uh, photograph of a royal bride. Um, and you can see she's, a, she's actually a little taller than her mother who's on the left, although the angle of the photo does not show you that. Um, they are, uh, she is uh, getting married uh, almost precisely 18 years after her parents were married and in the same place, uh, St. George's Palace. She's wearing a very, uh, a lot of lace and um, these, all these uh, uh, German wedding flowers, myrtle and orange blossom were something that, that the Germans believed in and was brought to Britain starting with um, Vicky's wedding. Mm -hmm. And is this, uh, this is an aside and this is a massive piece of trivia, but is this the same myrtle that all the royal brides um, yeah. uh, they, they in, put in their bouquet now, right? That's right. In, yeah. in, in 1845, Victoria, Queen Victoria went with Albert for the first time to his home in Coburg near uh, uh, north of Munich. Um, and at that time, she was given a cutting of a large myrtle plant in the past castle grounds in Coburg. And then she planted it, I believe, in Osborne. Mm -hmm. uh, it may have been replanted since then. But that myrtle plant has provided flowers for Royal Bryce since then. I know it's it's kind of it's so fascinating, yeah. and then we have one more. Uh, we have the one picture of um, Queen and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert with a whole lot of children. Um, oh, this is this is actually Vicky and, this and is Vicky Fritz, and Fritz um, on their honeymoon. Yeah. On their honeymoon, yeah. I know yeah. it's a very yeah. serious honeymoon <laughs> photo. She's seventeen. Uh, he's twenty six. Mm -hmm. This is one of the only existing photographs of Fritz not wearing his uh, military uniform. Really? In the wars of unification in Germany, he was a great military hero. Um, and, and he was rarely seen like this. But here he is on the grounds of Windsor with his new bride. They were allowed a 48-hour honeymoon. Oh my the rest gosh. of the family descended after 48 hours. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> but despite that, they uh, started and maintained a very romantic um, and uh, very satisfying mutual relationship that lasted for their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So this serious photo aside, they, yes. they actually, they actually had, had, a, they actually had a pretty, they had a very passionate, um, not what we think of as Victorian uh, um, relationship, uh, as did her mother and father. I mean, this is only yeah. a fraction of the children that Queen Victoria had. Yes, and this is when he only, she only had five. Um, but Vicky, who's mm -hmm. uh, down on the right-hand corner there looking yeah. at the baby, she was a bit annoyed by this painting, uh, which I use as a scene in my, in my novel. This was a painting commissioned by her father to show the royal domestic life. And she was very annoyed that it's her brother who's up next to the uh, Queen Victoria wearing the red tunic. That is actually a boy, Bertie. And of course, the, the symb symbolism is that Victoria has her arm around her son because he is her heir. Mm -hmm. And Vicky, despite being eldest, and as she would point out best, was not the heir. <laughs> 
I mean, we could get we I, I we could get a, I don't know I, we might I might digress because I'm very fa I'm fascinated by um, the idea that she she did not get to be queen she she was considered smarter than her brother um, although it's interesting her brother kind of probably had better people smarts yes that's so interesting you should uh, point that out Lucia and um, when he was a child the heir Bertie was much looked down upon for his um we would probably consider them learning disabilities he had a lot of difficulty learning to read he had, he couldn't he couldn't sit still um he also had a lot he was very clumsy it took him a long time to learn to ride a horse and run and everything he was just not as good as Vicky however <laughs> he was always a charming personality in a way that she wasn't in some ways Prince Albert um, said he was a throwback to the Hanoverians that, that, that those disreputable kings they wanted to change the reputation right. of. But he had social skills they didn't have. Um, and um, the, Vicky and Bertie were rivals as children, or Vicky, Vicky just wanted to stomp on Bertie, but they were friends throughout their life. Yeah. And um, uh, despite the rivalry between them, they were actually they were actually very close um, yes. in, in many ways. Yeah. So, yes. so to sort of go back to so we go back to Vicky's marriage and she is thrust in this court life. It, it almost reminded me a little bit or maybe I'm being fanciful. It almost reminded me a little bit of, of when Diana was thrust into the life of the Windsors or um, well, there's so many funny parallels, both with Diana yeah. and I feel with Megan too. Let's start with Diana though. Diana was shocked to find that uh, Charles's family was cold and remote. And Vicky was, was, was really surprised. She had had some exposure to Fritz's parents before she went to live in Berlin with them. Um, but she couldn't believe how, also how mean they were to each other. It was an extremely contentious family environment. Um, and she was not used to that at all. Mm -hmm. The thing that really trumped it, and, and in some ways is like Megan, is that um, Vicky had very advanced political ideas for her time. She believed in, in that the monarchy should really play a second fiddle to the people's representatives, to parliamentary democracy. In, in Berlin at that time, that was, um, you know, the way we, we would regard communism now. I mean, you know, we can't, we're not taking that on board. And you shouldn't say these things. You're, you're supposed to shut up and have children. So Vicky had that problem too. She wanted to talk about modern ideas and no one wanted to hear them. Yeah. And, and, but she did fulfill that end of the bargain in that she did have a lot of children and one yeah, of the children. She did, and and she, she loved, she loved little babies. Um, she had eight of them. Uh, but of course the problem was that the first one, which she was That's pregnant, you know, she was pregnant uh, four months after her marriage as well, a little bit further along than, I mean, she had a little bit of a gap more than her mother, but not much. So she was just barely 18 years old when she was having her first child in a situation where um, they didn't really want to take good advice. They didn't let her be examined by an obstetrician before the birth because that wouldn't be dignified. So they missed the fact that, that her first baby was breech. And so um, there was a catastrophic 36 hour labor mm -hmm. in which they were extremely lucky to find the best specialist in Berlin at the very last minute to yank the baby presumed dead out of her womb and save her life because her, 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 her husband was hysterical. He said, she cannot die. I don't care about the baby. And she almost she, died, didn't she? She, did. she came yeah. within inches and the baby uh, was miraculously survived. However, with a wrenched, uh, what we would call mm -hmm. um, a brachial mur break um, that left his uh, left arm uh, uh, lame for life. And that the Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, he was eventually, this baby became Kaiser Wilhelm. But the shame that Vicky felt out of having produced a um, handicapped baby was almost overwhelming to her psychologically. And it was, and, and, it, and, and without getting like too complicated about things, I feel like that psychological rift between mother and child in many ways changed 20th century history all because of some <laughs> difficult no, all because of a difficult birth um i mean it was a difficult birth not to minim not to diminish that but they he became the exact antithesis of his parents which to me led to world war one which led to world war ii which led to so much of the way um europe is actually you know 
Yeah, you see, today. that's why that's it's why so it's fascinating. So fascinating, and this is why I think it was it's worth sometimes writing fiction about the royals. Yes, they are just a family like the rest of us, except for all the stakes are higher. Everything mm -hmm. matters, right? So this baby was born um, handicapped. Uh, they had a lot of trouble bringing him up. They had a lot of bad feelings about it all. And at the same time, Germany was united, but in a very militaristic way. And this little vulnerable boy was influenced by the militarism, triumphalism. He wanted to believe that he, you know, he belonged to this great mythic line of kings. And anyway, it all started going off rails. And the, the actual personality of the young Willie, um, as you say, had a, a very detrimental effect on European politics because he was on the top of the newly uh, unified Germany, immediately the third largest economy in the world in the 1870s, rivaling Britain all the time. And, and Willie's resentment toward his family played into his resentment against England, which played into um, the outbreak of World War I. He did not do it alone, but he <laughs> certainly helped. <laughs> he definitely he helped. No, he didn't do it alone, but he, yeah, it, it, it was just, and, and what was so fascinating about that time and World War I is all these, all these royals were so interrelated. So he was the first cousin of, yes. you know. Willie is the first cousin of the uh, Tsar of Wilhelm. Russia. And they were all there, like, yeah. Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm was the first cousin of George V, who was right. the king of England during war. And, and, the, and George V was the first cousin of the Kaiser. So um, they are, it's called, you could call it the cousin's war because it wasn't. And at one point the Kaiser thought, well, we can sort this all out if we can get together as a family. At which point the general said, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> of I'm hearing like, oh, we can all work this out if we get together as a family. I'm like, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. <laughs> <laughs> given given the, the sometimes fractious nature of family absolutely but. absolutely <laughs> but to get i mean and to get back to vicky i mean vicky she was only um the empress she was only the empress for it was tragic like 99 days it, yeah i was gonna say a couple of months because fritz was incredibly ill and and that to me was just maybe the biggest tragedy of all is here was this love match and they yeah. worked so hard and then there he is he's so ill and he's so brave he was you brave throughout um you know he had seen a lot of bloodshed in the three the three wars that were fought for german independence not in, um, unification and uh, he was a very um he was loved by his men they called him unser fritz our fritz um, and they followed him, him into these these incredible battles in which he always triumphed, along with other great the, in the Prussian military um, uh, skills and their incredible weaponry in the 1860s and 70s um, made them uh, dominant. They also studied the American Civil War and saw when where the Union went wrong and what well, vowed they weren't going to make those kind of mistakes. Right. However, the, the, yes, it was a great tragedy because. Um, they had prepared for many years to be on top of this new country. And yet Fritz's father lived on and on and on and on. <laughs> and meanwhile, when he was, you know, Bismarck was really pulling all the strings from behind the, uh, uh, behind the scenes. And he, he created a Germany that was, you know, fundamentally bellicose. And that's why it is a tragedy that Fritz didn't live and that he and Vicky weren't on top of this to make, to try to tamp it down in the early days of the German empire instead their son took over and he didn't do anything. He fanned the flames. It's really mm -hmm. interesting to me that Vicky was really an important person also in the early efforts to stop the anti-Semitism that began to rage um, in Germany. And uh, if I get right a sequel about Vicky, I'm gonna talk about that because she, again, um, you know the way Diana shook hands with the person who had AIDS? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Vicky went to synagogue because she wanted to say, these people are just like us. We're all, we're all children of God. And uh, she was very brave to do that. Um, I, I'm gonna stop there. That I know. I was gonna wrap. I was. I was looking at the clock. I was almost gonna wrap it up. <laughs> no. I, I honestly. I well. I want. I need to stop there because we have a couple of questions. But oh. I also love that you, what you just said. I okay. love that. That's what you. What you ended on because I think that that's really beautiful, and I think that's a lovely message. And drawing that comparison to Princess Diana um, is really just lovely. I mean, this is one great big family. Um, and so this was fantastic. 
Thank Chris you. Laney, um, we have a couple questions. Can you can you uh, read them off? Yeah. Well, one last picture. I just wanted to show that. Oh. That's Victor. That's Vicky when she's older, correct? Yes, that's her later in life. Sorry, I just want to put that in for. Yeah, you. beautiful. Oh, good. Beautiful. Yeah, and we do have quite a few questions. Um, just to start things off, Shannon Wilson Spies asks, Claire, do you have a history history degree, or do you just love history? Thank you for asking. I, um, I did take my history degree at Harvard College. Um, I studied Bismarck and uh, for several years under a very distinguished professor named Charles Mayer, and that began my interest in the unification of Germany. Let's see here. And then Abby Burke says, obviously royals all over the world are very engaging and there is a lot written about them. So what drew you to Victoria's story in particular? Um, it was her predicament in life that she was a very um, bright person, denied really uh, a, a role that, that men could have, an opportunity. So how did she use what influence she did have to find purpose, um, to, to make the world a better place? She was a very earnest person. So that predicament attracted me. And I also think that this is an era that people forget about. They write a lot about World War II and they write a lot about the Tudors. There's so much in between. <laughs> so that's why I was attracted to this story. Um, and Vicki Nesting, so she, this is your debut, but are there any other historical uh, parts of the world that you might want to dive into in a next novel? Anything? I know you said another Vicki novel, but. Uh, you know, I am very tempted to do a novel about the America that I first knew in the 50s. I, you know, I'm almost 60 now. In the 50s and the 60s and the 70s went through a lot of changes in the United States, and I'm trying to find a way in that I think, um, uh, will illuminate some of the themes, especially from a distance. It shows that, you know, uh, we we change as a country really fast, <laughs> but a lot of people's lives got mixed up. So I'm I'm looking into that. Um, and then Jennifer Winberry said, "Have you considered how the monarchy would have been different if Parmenter wasn't the order of the day?" <laughs> that right. It's so interesting that you should ask that because it's, it's important to remember that in 2013, the law was changed um, uh, before Catherine and Middleton and Prince William could have any children. They has changed the law to say it will be the first child. And I, I said to Lucia, it should be Vicky's law because Vicky was the last person passed over because of her sex. All the uh, so sovereigns since then either had boys first or like um, Queen Elizabeth's father, only girls. So um, I, I think that I think that Vicky would have been a better heir. I talked to some professors about this, um, that she would have been probably better. But the very poignant thing is that she died only four months after her mother. So had she been the heir, heir you know, it wouldn't have been for very long. Um, but I'm very happy that the current law is established the way it should be. We have a question from uh, Barbara Jenko, who says, any nibbles for TV film rights sales? I want to read, then watch it now. <laughs> Thank you so much. We are looking, uh, and we've had some interest, but nothing definite. But here's a funny story. I don't know if any of you watch a show called A French Village. It's got a lot of Germans in it, a lot of French people in it. It's a great show. Anyway, there's a German actor in there named Richard Samler, who I love. I wrote to him the other day and I said, have you ever thought about playing Bismarck? He said, oh, I'm fascinated. So I'm sending him the book. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> all right, um, we have a, a couple questions that are similar. Maureen Roberts said, well, this is all fascinating. Was Vicky's personality anything like her mother's? Do you think that was part of the problem with how she was received in Berlin? Uh, absolutely. They, uh, uh, Vicky was a combination of both her parents. Uh, she tended to be, uh, um, uh, she's very energetic, like the queen and very starchy, like, oh, we do it like this, you know, that's partly what, and she was very intellectual, like her, um, uh, uh, like her father and tended to talk in this kind of lofty tones. Um, so, uh, yes. And also people wanted to tell her in Berlin, Hey, you don't get any special treatment because you're queen Victoria's daughter. I mean, there was an immediate resentment, like don't get yourself on a high horse. You're not even German. And she would point out that actually she was three quarters German. So it was a bad match uh, from the start. I think we have time for one last question. Um, Barbara Ringel, I don't think we asked this one, did we? What was Vicky's relationship with her, with her mother like? 
oh, I'm really glad that this is the last question and that it got answered. It, they had um, a difficult relationship when, um, when Vicky was a girl because Albert idolized Vicky and would write to the queen about all her faults. So the contrast between the treatment that she was getting, uh, that, 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 that the ladies were getting was caused tension. However, once that they were apart, they were like, almost like sisters. Um, they uh, wrote to each other th two or three times a week. The correspondence between them is the main source of um, the action uh, that I depict in uh, A Most English C Princess. However, Queen Victoria never stopped being a uh, mom when she wanted to be. For example, she would write to Queen, uh, to poor Vicky in Berlin, who by that time had five children. And you know, like, now, did you spend the whole day of Papa's death at church? You know, the poor woman, like, can, can you just like, leave me alone? I, I, I got a whole life of my own over here. <laughs> and I'm no queen that everybody takes the rules. But, but Vicky was always very polite and kind to her, her mother and very dutiful. And by the time they were, you know, in there, in uh, she was in her 40s and the queen was in their 60s, they looked a lot alike and they, they behaved and, and they were very, very close. That's, that's a great way to end this really wonderful half hour. So informative. Thank you, Lainey, for showing that beautiful jacket one last time. Uh, a Most English Princess, a novel of Queen Victoria's daughter uh, by... Uh, we're thrilled that you could come here today and speak with us, um, Claire and, uh, Thank and Chia. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a fabulous conversation. I know. I could, I was like getting on a roll. I was like, I could keep going, but I know we have more than you have more to get to. So, well, ba honestly, based on all the comments, and you can go back and watch this later on if you want to. There's so much love for this subject in this book, and they awesome. and people just want to know more, more, more. So. Um, hey, listen. Well, I'll, come to, I'll come to anyone's library who writes to me at ClaireMcHugh.com. ClaireMcHugh.com. Note the spelling of Claire, C-L-A-R-E, McHugh.com. Reach out to Claire if you want her to virtually come to your library or, or physically, whenever that'll be. But uh, you can see, this is, I mean, you are just so chock full of wonderful um, information and enthusiasm. And it, this was fantastic. So thank you, thank very you much. so, so much thank for you, doing Lucia. this. Lucia, thank you. This was this was wonderful. Oh my gosh, this was my pleasure. This was so much fun. Um, and I think it's worth noting Lucia has her library degree, so she. I do, is. and the aforementioned Barbara Jenko was one of my professors. I there don't think is. she'll remember me. But. Oh, you're memorable. <laughs> she remembers you. We love you. Um, so Claire, congratulations um, on your book birthday for A Most English Princess on sale today. And take good care. Be well. Thank you both so much. And everybody hang on because now we're going to bring in thank you. Um, David and Natalie to talk about <laughs> Awesome. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. How cool was that? Very that was amazing. Cool. Holy moly. <laughs> It's, it's interesting to hear them talk and it feels like they're talking about something now. They just bring you in yeah. with all the detail. It's, it's living, it feels like living history. Yeah. I don't know, it was just really those, fascinating. Those photos that she supplied, yeah. I was just staring, you know, there's so Super much cool. detail, it's so yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's see if they've eaten all the green M&Ms. <laughs> Here we go. All right, you guys, bring them in, bring them in. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. How are the, how are the M&Ms? Were they good? Delicious. Thank you for removing the brown ones as is appropriate. Of, uh, as you requested. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, we just had a very robust and fun uh, half hour talking with um, author and editor. And now we're going to do it again. So David Pomerico and Natalie Zena Walshots here to talk about Hench. Take it away. So we're here to talk about Hench. Woo! So good. Um, I, I now I feel like that there's a lot of pressure on us to be fun and entertaining, um, but uh, I think we can do it. I think we can do it, Natalie. Well, are you going to sing <laughs> a song? <laughs> no, nah, I think we can manage. No, we're going to keep the uh, the Hench theme song for later. Um, oh, very good. <laughs> that's that's for the that's for the paperback. All right, um, all right, yeah, yeah. Before you start, I don't want to. I I would be remiss if I did not say that this is among all of the starred reviews, the accolades are so many. I mean, PW, Kirkus, LJ, uh, Booklist, starred reviews all. 
and our lead read. I mean, this is really quite something. Um, so anyway, happy book birthday to you. Thank you. And now David. No one more than me, I promise you all. <laughs> okay. Well, um, probably the easiest thing to start with is, Natalie, why don't you give us a, a quick overview of the novel? Just uh, just tell us what's, what, what it's about. Sure. Um, Hench is the story of a, a young hench woman, uh, one of the expendable, um, overlooked, and, and terribly downtrodden uh, employees of supervillains, um, who uh, who's at the beginning of the novel, like really just trying to live and have food and rent, um, and do is doing a lot of boring tasks for very very terrible people. Uh, she has a run-in um, with a kind of uh, primary superhero of this particular universe that um, leaves her very badly injured and uh, starting to calculate the cost of superheroes um, in time in terms of, uh, you know, both money and, and human lives when it comes to, you know, the, the impact that they have on the communities that they're ostensibly uh, supposed to protect. Um, she does this via the power of blogging, social media, and data science, um, discovers that actually heroes are terribly bad, um, and sort of begins uh, her ascent uh, in, in a in a, in a new villainous career with sort of um, redoubled vigor and intensity. Um, and I realized that that probably made it sound uh, very heavy and very dorky, but I, I promise you it's, it's also quite funny. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's sort of the, at least the starting point overview of, of what Hench is about. But um, there's, there's a lot of uh, body horror and critiques of the police state as well as math. Totally. Um, so like you mentioned the idea of like the, the cost, uh, the, the people cost yes. um, of superheroes. And I know that was based off of research uh, mm -hmm. that you, can you tell us more about that? Like, cause this is based Absolutely. off of real world stuff. Yeah, it's, it's real. All the math in the book works um, and can in fact be run on any real life or superheroic scenario, it turns out. Um, the uh, it's based on the research of uh, of a um, a professor at the uh, in, in who lives in New Zealand. His name is Elon Noy, um, and a lot of his work is used by um, global organizations that measure the. Um, impact of uh, natural disasters on human populations. So I took his equations, I took his math um, and applied it to the impact that superheroes have on, on those communities. Um, so the research that I did involved uh, looking at all the like property damage, injuries and deaths in a particular comic uh, or comic story arc, adding them up and sort of seeing what the human life year cost was um, and sometimes measuring that against what the villainous life year cost was in the same stories. And uh, by far and away, the heroes do the most damage. So the conclusions that Anna um, comes to in the book are, are, are based on research that like it, it works in real life and also in fictional life. Um, so all, all her math uh, works out and, and the, the conclusions she comes to like can be proven. Yeah. Again, to be clear, it sounds very math heavy. But it <laughs> it is, does. It is, in fact, fascinating and <laughs> funny and entertaining. So mm -hmm. um, don't be scared away. There's there's not actually a test at the end of the book. Um, <laughs> there are no visible spreadsheets, although I do have them in my own personal home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Real so, fun at parties now, let me tell you. I bet. Um, speaking of being fun at, at parties, um, <laughs> why do you hate superheroes? Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't start off hating superheroes. I come by it honestly, um, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I, I'm like, I'm a lifelong fan of, uh, of superhero comics and stories, um, but I've always been drawn to villains, but in particular, I've always been drawn to hench people because you sort of see them getting like thrown at heroes like like uh, like human appetizers or cannon fodder and then like 
throw they're thrown through a window and we're not supposed to ever think about them again but it's like hey you you all had matching outfits and seem to also come from a triple a hockey team based mm -hmm. on your skill set so i'm very confused about a how you got here uh and um you know be like uh what what your whole story is and like and also what happens to you now after you're grievously injured um but we're not supposed to think about that like we're not supposed to think about what happens to like as soon as you start thinking about you know well what happens to all these hench people or even what happens to all these innocent bystanders but in particular what happens to all these hench people it makes it really difficult to enjoy superhero stories the same way once you you know e even if you're not like running the actual math um like i do for fun i guess uh when you when you look at um when you start seeing it even like in the periphery and on the edges of those stories it makes it really really hard um to unsee it and to kind of enjoy them the same way so it was sort of a a gradual you know erosion process um i'm also not a huge fan of cops so like kind of a natural progression there as well no i uh i i hear you it, it makes it definitely feel a lot more i mean you didn't write that this year but it definitely has mm. like a lot of relevance i think not just you know with the you know the kind of totalitarian you know police state uh but also the um the idea of just being like, what do you do when you're stuck at home and you like, <laughs> like, can't go to work? Oh, maybe I'll uh, start a blog or, you know, start Zooming with people or whatever. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's it's more relevant than I, I would have wished it to be, <laughs> I assure you. But uh, yeah, like the, the critiques um, that exist in the book have obviously been there the whole time, um, but are uh, really heightened, I think, by, you know, gestures broadly at the earth by kind of like everything that um that we're all going through right now right um so one of the like so if you haven't read the new york times today there was a <laughs> great review of, uh, of hench um oh and, in, and at one point they, they talk about um anna being an anti-hero um do you mm. consider anna an anti-hero um because i feel like that that's a, a, like a loaded term it is, and like I'm, I don't object to it. Like for sure, it's something that I've heard a few times, and it's it's not um, it's not something that I like react negatively to. But I do think antihero has a a very particular kind of like you know this person might be hard to love, but ultimately like they're still moving in the right direction, or you know they're on the kind of like you know, side of law and order in, but just maybe in a slightly unconventional way. Like I, you know, I think of like, like House or BBC Sherlock or something. It's like, really what that means is like, they're, they're good, but also a jackass, right? Like that's, uh, that's kind of where that comes from. And for sure, Anna has, you know, a lot of snark and, uh, and like is, sometimes um you know that her her sense of humor is quite sharp edged um but uh i don't think that um you know she would she would consider what she's doing heroic at all even in kind of a, an anti way um i think it's it's maybe sort of like uh, D and D alignment chart instead of you know the, the hero anti hero she's more like chaotic um, you know she's she's sort of a, a is the the opposite of um, of order in that way so I think I think I'm a little bit more comfortable with those terms um, but I also think that there's like there are reasons that that term has been applied to her and I I don't think they're entirely wrong at all and and I certainly don't um, find it objectionable when it's used I just don't think it's complete. Yeah, no, I, mm. I I kind of always think of Anna like in the same way I think of uh, Omar from The Wire, where yeah. it's like he has a code, he's yeah. you know he's got a sense of justice, but he's a criminal, he's a stick up artist, you know he's a drug dealer, like he's definitely a sure. bad guy, um, but he's got a sense of okay, like there's a way things should be, and I he's can... got his he's got his own internal compass, right, exactly. and Anna very a very strong internal compass um you know and I I worked very hard um to 
make her journey one that, um, you know, that the, the reader was sort of positioned to be carried along on, like you understand, hopefully, um, at every juncture, why she's making the choices that she does. And they make sense, right? Like that, based on what you know about her and her situation, like her, her choices, even if you don't totally agree with them, you see profoundly where they're coming from, um, which also uh, carries you along on, you know, potentially to a morally gray place that can get a little squicky. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously, like, you know, there's a lot of talk in the last few years, uh, but especially this year about representation mm -hmm. in, in literature. And this book specifically talks a lot about uh, neurodivergence and LGBTQ uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. um, in I think very stark, but also very positive ways. Um, like, why did you decide to touch on those subjects and have your characters experience, you know, those um, characteristics? I mean, very much the characters that I write about um, come from a real place in my own life. Like I am surrounded by um, an in I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by an incredibly diverse group of people. And uh, it was really important to me that anything I write reflect that community and come from that kind of like real place that I experience. Um, I think it's a grave mistake to reduce representation to um, kind of one or two characters or to kind of have that like, well, we need, you know, I, I want, uh, you know, we want it to be balanced, right? So that still means like X number of straight people and X number of cis people versus like, you know, um, that's not the community that I experience. It's not the world I experience. The, the world I experience is extremely weird and extremely queer um, and not necessarily white and not necessarily neurotypical, um, certainly. So that uh, I, I, I wanted the book to look like that um, because it, it's the world that I am in. Um, so that, uh, that came kind of very naturally out of that but also you know there was um there was no way i was going to make something that had a token character or a few token characters it's like it's not about like one or two people it's like no this is the entire book looks like this um a thing that like irritates me a lot about science fiction and fantasy and this is in no way a diss um, in any specific direction, but like you get to make the world like you get you get to make it up you get to do it all yourself why is like, you know, your, your Blade Runner future, like super white and straight like that, first of all, inaccurate, like secondly, why would you just remake that? Or why would you just like, why it, it, it feels like a failure of imagination um, to me. So yeah, that was, that was, uh, I have a lot of feelings about this, um, but it was, it was very important that, you know, the, the world that I create um, look like the world that I live in, uh, kind of like that Tumblr meme, like, you know, I, I haven't seen a straight person in three days, <laughs> as opposed to like, well, there's 10 people. So like one person maybe could be gay. Like, it's just, it's just not, not the place that I exist in. And it wasn't the book that I wanted to spend time in either. No, and I, I think that the, the great thing is like, is how organically the book reads. So that like, if you're so used to the idea mm -hmm. of, you know, people who are look like and <laughs> represent me um mm -hmm. are like the norm it's like no like this is a completely natural world mm -hmm. um so i think it's like really good for like people who maybe aren't as familiar with those communities to totally realize, no these are just as much a part of the community they have you know full rich exciting lives um so it, it's definitely one of the things that drew me into the story like because you you know, it, it's an area that I'm still trying to learn about and, you know, communities I'm trying to uh, be more a part of. Um, For sure. And it, I, it was important to me, too, that most of the conflict in the book not come from that place, yeah. you know, that it's just like, which isn't to say there is zero conflict that has anything to do with, you know, gender or, or whatever, but that, um, 
that was not the main source of the conflict. Because I think, I think, and I'll, we have a lot of wonderful stories about, you know, primarily that kind of conflict, but I, I did want it to just like exist and be there and have it be a part of the architecture of the world building um, instead of like, you know, this is, this is something that the, yeah, the primary action or the uh, primary conflict takes place around. Cause I think, I think there, there needs to be more space for that just to be there, just to yeah. exist and to be normalized. Yeah. Um, so you brought up conflict. Uh, so I'm going to take it into a slightly lighter <laughs> uh, topic. Prom promise like before it is funny. <laughs> no, it is definitely funny, um, but it's definitely dark. And like, that sure. like the, the, that's the balance. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously a lot of the conflict is that Anna survives her encounter with Super Collider. Yeah. Liberty. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, see? <laughs> um, the so fact this that this has been like made by a human, like has provided me with infinite glee. Like somebody was like, hmm, what would the villains union insignia look like? Cause it's, it's, it's gotta be like, look like an official logo, but also stupid. And I like, it's just <laughs> perfect. I love it so much. But anyway, this gives me, thank you team at, at Harper Collins for giving me this great gift. <laughs> Of no, this, this piece of design. This is amazing. Uh, but it does lead me to this idea of, you know, you've created your own superhero universe. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be fun though, to think about like, who do you think Anna would match up with well in say like a DC oh. or Marvel universe? Like yeah, what superhero yeah, yeah. would she be like the perfect nemesis for? Ooh, she would like hate the crap out of Batman. Like oh, straight yeah. up, like <laughs> like ab absolutely like. But Batman like, doesn't kill anybody. Bullshit! I, I call absolute <laughs> crap on that. I'm gonna disabuse everybody of that right now. I, there I, is I, no <laughs> way that Batman does not give somebody a spinal injury and then two years later they die of a bed sore. And guess what? <laughs> that's murder. Like yeah. legally, it is. That's that's murder on you if that happens. So I don't know. Lies and slander. Anyway, again, have feelings about this, um, but yeah, she would she would for sure have like a serious problem with the like just the sheer amount of physical damage that Batman causes. I by the way, run the math. He's the worst um, in terms of just like body count, like injury and death body count, um, but not counting like giant world cataclysmic events, just like one person kind of like human wrecking ball. Um, so I think I think that that she would be a extremely uh, challenging part of his rogues gallery for sure. I think she'd have a lot more sympathy for um, heroes like Peter Parker um and miles morales who who are just like who still have to like go to school and do homework <laughs> right and you know like deal with the earth right like the that they're that i think she would she would feel a lot more sympathy and be like uh toward you know like a younger people but also people who are just like trying to do a thing and get by and also putting on a ridiculous costume because she's been there um, I think we're getting close to uh, our time. So I, I had like two more questions. Um, okay. And then we have a bunch of questions. Okay. Back. Okay. So, Perfect. So great. first thing, as a debut novelist, um, yes. this has been obviously, I'm, I'm assuming, a pretty heady experience. Like, what's one thing you've learned over this experience that you would pass on yeah. to a, another writer? Um. I mean, everything has kind of been this, like, I feel like every day for a very long time now I've been waking up and it's like a completely new and different thing that I was not prepared for or, or you know, uh, prepped to deal with. But um, everything is going to take longer than you think, um, for sure. So, like, if you think, do you know, doing a piece of editing is going to take you a week, it's going to take you two weeks. Like, just kind of whatever amount of time you think a thing will take, like, budget probably twice that and then if you're done early hooray but like you know for sure give, give yourself the like time and space that you need to actually do the thing um because everything else in the world will 
just keep cropping up and just keep happening. Uh, it turns out even when you're trying to work on the thing. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a big part of it. Um, I mean, secondly, like having a support network, both in terms of like the people you are working with and in your personal life is, is absolutely critical, right? Like, like on, questionably like if I didn't if I didn't have the trust that I had like in you and the rest of the team at HarperCollins like I would not be in this situation I would not be here the book would not be nearly as good you know if I didn't have an, ex an incredible agent who's super on my team like I would also not be in this situation like so having having people in your corner who you can trust is essential for sure also my friends rule <laughs> and have taken really good care of me when I've been in a state of lying on the floor eating Doritos. So nice. Um, I'm. I always like to whenever I'm talking like on a panel or something. I always like to ask this: um, mm -hmm. What's the last great piece of art, book, TV show, music, whatever that you've interacted with? Oh man, most recently, um, and I'm not done the series but uh lovecraft country is like absolutely blowing me away like it's so good um and so tense and yeah i i'm absolutely loving it and librarians it's a harper Collins. Uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah i mean that's that's all i have i mean natalie thank you so much i'm sure oh did thank you, you have a ton of stuff Virginia's gonna fill us in on now like mm. in terms of yeah well first of all Great. David thank you so much this was a fabulous interview I mean this is you know this book is just blowing out and to hear this this is such a unique relationship and so for us to for all of us to sit and listen to the two of you um talk about you know so many different aspects of the book is really wonderful so uh, David, thank you so much for coming on. And um, now we have mm -hmm. um, we have questions. So Chris and Lainey, do you want to start from the saying? top? And uh, we'll we'll start with the questions that came in while you all were um, chatting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's mainly the first few are just all caps. Natalie, Hinch, I love this book. <laughs> So, remember um, those friends I said were awesome? Yeah, <laughs> probably have been yelling in the comments this whole no, time. No, <laughs> librarians love this book so much. They, they can't wait so to, funny. yeah, they were so excited to see that you were on today. So um, Paulette Brooks has a question about the audio book. And yes. You, um, like that, who the narrator is. And then someone, I don't, someone else. Oh, um, what is the process like picking the voice for the audio book? Great questions. Uh, so there is an audio book. It's narrated by Alex McKenna, who's incredible. Um, I was actually most familiar with her work through um, her, her voice work for video games. She's like Sadie in Red Dead Redemption 2. She does some like really, really amazing voice acting. Um, so that drew me to her right away, you know, that I was, I was familiar with her work in that context. Um, but uh, Hers, I, I listened to, um, I, I, I was sent about um, five or six uh, kind of like short list of, of voice actors that were like, uh, here are our top picks, what do you think? Um, and with some samples and I listened to a whole bunch from all of them and Alex McKenna made me laugh out loud first and like most frequently unquestionably she had like a way of of delivering like insults in particular that was like super deadpan and just killed me and i could i could really hear her um doing anna's voice justice so that was she she was a very clear standout for me there were also some like amazing other voices that if selected would have done an extraordinary job and i would have been super happy with but um yeah it was it was just her her delivery of humor was just so bang on our friend katie stover with the kansas city public library an early early reader of this book super fan from the get-go says i want a sequel too soon I mean, I too would love a sequel. That sounds that sounds rad and great. Um, it's something that I'm thinking about uh, and something that like, since the reception has been what it has been that I'm thinking a lot more seriously about. Um, so I, uh, 
I, I can't comment on like, yes, this is directly going to happen, but I, I promise I too would love for that to be in the future as well. And I have a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, John Sandler said, I also wanted to ask about some of the poetic passages, especially when Anna gains augmented senses and there's a reference to Paradise Lost is in the book. Um, does poetry influence your prose? Uh, so unfortunately I was a poet first. Um, I, have, I have a graduate degree in contemporary Canadian poetry and uh, I, have, I have two poetry books that were uh, small press poetry books that were, were released um, years ago. So I, I come from that background. Um, language is extremely important to me and the, um, the, the like artistic power of language. Um, I, 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 my poetry has uh, typically been like very constraint based or like, you know, like uh, formalist or mannerist or like very, very heavily um, constrained and kind of the way that it, it works. Um, and I think that in those, those few moments that kind of pops out a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really neat that that was picked up on because that, that is sort of like my, my very first, uh, the first published writing that I did was, uh, was poetry and something that I spent a ton of time in for a, a very long time. Let's see, our friend Abby Burke says, can you see redeeming qualities of superheroes or is there a scenario where you think they could work? Oh yeah, sure. Like I think, I don't think all superheroes are terrible people. I do think um, like a lot of power structures in real life, uh, certainly the superheroes in, um, in the world that I've created and in a lot of other fictional worlds, kind of uh like the way that they operate they kind of can only be so good or they can't be good right like there's um there are you know when you're sort of like part of a a totalitarian like power structure even if you're like like really think of yourself as a nice person and like try to be good there's only so good you can be supporting that and being a part of that and kind of like being uh, being a part of that system and that structure. So um, I, I think it's more, it's less that I don't feel like superheroes could ever be a thing or like a person with superpowers could ever be like a good person. Like, yes, of course, but uh, I, I don't think, uh, it is possible to be good while operating within one of those those structures. Um, Maureen Roberts, we didn't ask this one yet, right? From Maureen Roberts from Baltimore County Library says, who were some of the science fiction fantasy authors who influenced you? Oh man, so, uh, so many. Um, I'm like, Ursula Le Guin is somebody who is incredibly um, important to me. Um, I uh, like I'm I'm very happy to call them them friends now, but um, both Madeline Ashby and David Nichol um, are like uh, are a science fiction and horror writer who had whose work had a really big impact on me for sure. Um, Becky Chambers, who I'm going to get to talk to later this week, which is blowing my tiny mind, uh, is extraordinary, both in the way that she kind of like creates, um, like her world building is, is amazing. And the way that she integrates um, like text messages and, you know, like, uh, like, online chat room conversations like into the fabric of her novels like like there's all this other extra textual material that is just like really really brilliantly done um you know i i also think that you know like like comic art artists and writers like fiona staples have you know and and uh uh have had a huge impact on me and like and like you know gail simone and i, I all, all of those writers um, have all kind of like poured their stuff into my brain. And there's like 8,000 others that are just not at the you know, tip of my tongue right now, but um, who've also like really, really had an impact on me. Um, I don't know if we have any questions that haven't been answered. 
uh, Chris Laney, if there are, but Laney, I know that there's a quick recording that we want to play. Oh, yes, would be. We have to share this one. So, you know, we got a little voicemail yesterday, just a little one, no big deal. Oh, Nancy. This is so nice. <laughs> so Nancy Pearl, who we love, uh, the world loves, she loves Henge and she wanted to tell everybody how much she loves it. Oh my God. Hi. This is Nancy Earl, and I'm just calling in to say how much I love Natalie's novel, Hench. I think it's one of the smartest books that I've read in a long time. I love the main character, Anna, as a librarian. I love the way she, um, that her super, her superpower happens to be data and uh, working with spreadsheets and in the end weaponizing data. Um, I, I, it was such fun to read and I can't wait for a sequel. I hope there's, uh, there's another book coming with this main character because she was a delight and the book is absolutely great. Bye. That is like the purest thing in the entire world. <laughs> it's <just> like <laughs> my heart. So. Yeah, she's been, she, she wrote uh, and said that she uh, had been on a, I don't know, she met you at the, one of the virtual um, regional shows and just said, yes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my God, so love lovely. her. Yeah, she just, just thinks the world of, uh, not only of the book, but of you. So uh, she's That's happy so to. That's so uh, lovely. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. She's Thank, such a delight. She's, she's wonderful. She's just a, a terrific person and beloved uh can't say enough about Nancy. Um, and so uh, whose book just went on sale, the writer's library. Mm -hmm. We had her on a couple of weeks ago and she was fantastic. So um, nice to have the support from, uh, as I say, you can go back and watch this uh, Facebook live and there's not only are there questions that Chris and Laney have asked, but there's just so much love and people are so excited about this and excited for you. I mean, this is a really exciting, um, wonderful thing that's that that you that you've given the world and uh and it's coming back to you so congratulations to you thank you so much it's it's extraordinary and and profoundly unexpected and overwhelming and and wonderful so thank you so much i really appreciate it yeah i think i and i i i don't want to end of course we have to it's after three o'clock <laughs> But are there, is there anything that we've left? Are there any other questions? And of course, if there are more, I suppose we could have you answer them and we could write back. But oh, I, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to. Guys, are there any more that we need to? If there was just one more question and it was asked in all caps, so we know it's okay. important. It's, okay. uh, is there a TV show coming? Oh, man. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, that would, that, uh, that would be incredibly rad uh, and is, is still kind of like slightly outside of the scope of my imagination right now. But like it, it has it has occurred to me that it would be a pretty cool show. So like, wh why not? Why not start imagining things that are impossible? Like <laughs> it seems like the place to start doing that. Put it out in the universe. You put this out yeah. in the universe and look what put happens. That, put that energy out there. That's right. That's right. So, uh, Natalie, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if librarians want to have you virtually, uh, you know, zoom to their library, I'm assuming that's cool with you. 100%. Yeah, I'd love to. I'm, I'm super happy to, super happy to talk about the book and, and, you know, my process and yeah, any, anytime that, that would be great. Great. Okay. So there you go. You guys know how to get in touch with us and we can get in touch with Natalie and, um, congratulations. Thank happy you. book birthday. Thank you. Thank you for writing this. David, thank you so much for, for coming on and for letting us uh, just be witness to this great conversation about this really incredible book. And thank you for believing in, in this weird book. It's not hard. So many swears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to tell people that they need to subscribe to the podcast because I had the mm. great pleasure. And honestly, speaking for myself, it was so fun. I got to speak with you about- <laughs> It was very book. fun. I had so much fun. And you know, we talk about how- the 90s Batman and Robin, who the real story's about. We talk about <laughs> office millennial politics and what that even means. It's very fun. 
Um, so that's coming very soon. So everybody should subscribe to the Library Love Life podcast. Series. And Lainey, when do you think, when will that be up? Probably not this week, uh, but next. Okay, so there you go. Great. Um, Library Love Fest, check the podcast. And that's a, that'll be very fun to listen to. I know you were so excited when you got off that conversation. Very fun. So, okay, we, we lift a virtual glass to you and we thank you and we congratulate you and we wish you well. And uh, thank you all so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, David. Take good care. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take good care. Bye, everyone.